Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us once again. We thank you for your grace and for your strength, Father. We do pray that you bless the study tonight. Pray, dear Father, dear God, that you would anoint it with the words that you have from heaven. We pray, dear God, that your very spirit, dear Lord, would give utterance, would give guidance, dear Father, dear God. Just pray, dear Lord, that you'll help, that you'll bless, dear Father. We're depending upon thee. And so, Father, dear God, we pray that you'll bless us as we uh, try, dear Father, dear God, to impart the words of life by your help, dear God. So, Lord, we'll thank you for all that is accomplished, and we love you, and we appreciate you. In Jesus' name, amen. Ezra, the eighth chapter tonight. Ezra, the eighth chapter. And this title uh, for the study tonight will be the unity of God's people. The unity of God's people. So to just recap briefly, uh, we have looked at the Protestant Reformation under Luther and the uh, the restoration of the doctrine of justification. And we looked also at Wesley and that Reformation and the restoration of the doctrine of sanctification. And we found those types in the rebuilding of the second temple, the second temple. Uh, under the direction of Zerubbabel, the governor, and how God so mightily blessed in that uh, in that uh, in that coming together, and how God sent faithful men of God out, and uh, they began to come out of Babylon with the glimmer of hope and light, and going back to Jerusalem. And one of the first things they did when they got back to Jerusalem was to build the altar. Uh, and we know that before any move of God, there must be a selling out and sacrificing on the altar. And those are what those brethren did. And we saw that um, in the gospel day, in Wesley's day, uh, they were slain underneath the altar, sacrificing and selling out for God. And so now we're going to bring us into, uh, we're going to bring a bring the study into um, a restored people. Um, and we want to see this in the light of the scriptures tonight by the help of God. So Ezra uh, chapter 3. And verse number, or sorry, Ezra chapter, um, I believe, I want Ezra chapter 8, might be a typo on there, yeah, I believe, let me see here, actually, yes, Ezra chapter 3, Ezra chapter 3, and we'll begin with verse number 8. Now, in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Hinnadab with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course and praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted, with a great shout, when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men, that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before they, their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. I want us to draw a few points here. The remnant of the brethren. So God had a remnant. He had a faithful remnant that would rise up and would begin building according to the pattern. And we see uh, that they built a foundation according to the pattern because there were some elders there that recognized the, when the foundation was laid, they recognized that uh, as being similar to the foundation or to the temple that was laid under Solomon. And so they had built it similar, or they had built it uh, in a similar fashion uh, to the other temple. And that's how you got to build. You got to go back to the pattern. You got to go back to the way God has intended it to be built. Go back to the pattern that God gave Moses in the mount. And as a result, 
uh, you'll get the right you'll get the right results. And so the remnant of the brethren, God had some people that would rise up. God had some people that would build and that they would build right and they would build according to the pattern. In verse number nine, we see that they the sons of Judah together. They were together. They were unified. They worked in a unified fashion to build the temple. And you can only build with people who have the same mind. You cannot build with people who are uh, have a, three, four different ideas about how something should be built. God is only going to accept the people uh, who are striving together with one mind for the faith of the gospel. You have to have a togetherness. And it's not a togetherness that can just be manufactured. It's not a togetherness that can be worked up. It is a togetherness that has to come from God and have everybody has to be on the same page that God's will is what ultimately needs to be done. And we also see that the builders laid the foundation. And let's go over to Ephesians chapter 2 quickly and just draw a thought from this. We want to work more with the gospel day as we get into this evening time part of the message. So we want to, but we do want to make sure we give our due diligence uh, in covering old uh, Old Testament Israel, the kingdom of Israel down through the uh, history of Israel. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 20 says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And so the pattern was followed as set forth by Moses, and really, we know that the, the, the temple or the tabernacle that Moses constructed or drew the plans for uh, is a type of Christ. And so as we see all through the Old Testament, the Old Testament points to Christ. And everything we have done since the Old Testament should point back to Christ. Our foundation and all that we are should be Jesus Christ. And so as they came out, it was important uh, to build a foundation. And just real quickly, because we don't have time to get into it as much, uh, but when the fifth trumpet sounded, it says they opened up the bottomless pit. Well, what makes it bottomless? Well, there's no foundation. And whatever, whatever does not have a foundation will sink deeper and lower and will become uh, something that is never what God intended. And so it, it is important if you're going to build the house of God, if you're going to build the kingdom of God, that you lay the foundation right, that you have the right foundation and that you have the right materials wherewith to build. And so we see... Um, as it was written in Ezra chapter 3, verse number 2, it says, uh, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They went back to the pattern, and when they went back to the pattern, God began to bless them. We also see uh, some trumpets. Uh, we see that when the foundation was laid, the priests had some trumpets. They had some symbols. So we look at uh, verse number 10. It says, and when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel. Uh, with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of the David, after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And so, I want you to con compare that, or possibly, or more like contrast that with Psalms one thirty seven, when it says they had to hang their harps on the willow trees when they remembered Zion, because you can't sing the Lord's song uh, when you're in Zion. These people finally had something to shout to shout about. Finally, had something that they had a message they could. Rejoice in the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. And so they finally had a message and they finally had something wherewith they could shout about. Uh, why were they shouting? Because the temple was being restored and not just being restored, not just building a temple, but the temple was being restored to the primitive glory or to the glory of the morning time. It had there or they were building according to the pattern of the original. However, no matter how glorious that is, and there was, as we see, the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping. Some were weeping because they remembered uh, the, the previous temple. Some were shouting uh, because uh, they were so overfilled with overwhelmed with joy. And this thing seems to be going along so beautifully. Amen. And the people of God are coming together. They have left Babylon. They've constructed the altar. Uh, they have built the foundation. They are getting back to the pattern. The trumpets are going forth. People are praising the Lord. Uh, those that it, it was beginning to resemble 
It was beginning to resemble the previous house, the, the Solomon's temple. Uh, it had the similarities and it was being built according to the pattern. Amen. And as a result, they had something to shout about. But the devil is never, he is never going to let any move for God go unchecked. And so anytime there is a move for God, there will be some advers there will be uh, some opposition. And so there were adversaries to the construction. So I want us to get the picture though tonight that the foundation was laid and this thing seems to be moving in the right direction. Amen. It seems like very shortly the temple will be constructed. Amen. And this thing's just going to go on gloriously. Amen. But if we go to the next chapter, Ezra chapter 4, in verse number 1, it says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they wanted to come too. Then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you. For we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Asar Hadan, king of Assur, which brought us up hither. And so I just want to stop right there for a moment. These can be deceptive spirits. And these brethren were coming to Zerubbabel telling him, look, we're exactly the same as you. You can let us take part. You can let us engage in the work with you. We want to help you. We want to be a part of you. We want to be with you. And as a result, they were essentially, they're not satisfied. They are not satisfied uh, that these exclusive individuals are out here building the temple. And, there's, and this is the new exciting thing going on. They want a part of it as well. They actually don't tell the truth here, and we're going to study it a little bit tonight. It says, it says, and we do sacrifice unto him. Or sorry, let's go up a little bit. Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. We, we seek God too. We love God too. We want to worship God too. Um, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel. Or sorry. And we sacrifice unto him since the days of Esar Hadan, king of Aser, which brought us up hither. So let's study a little bit. How did they get there? How did they get there? All right. What are they doing um, in the kingdom of Israel if these are not Israelites? All right. If these are not Israelites. So let's go and study this. I believe it's 2 Kings 17. Let's go over to 2 Kings chapter 17. I didn't write that on the PowerPoint, but... Um, it's second Kings chapter 17 that we want for our thought or to get, gather the, uh, get the thought from the study tonight. Second Kings chapter 17 and verse number 24. We want to, we don't, there's quite a few scriptures we could read here, but for the sake of time, uh, we want to just draw a few thoughts. It says, and the King of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and from Ava and from Hamath and from Savarvaim and place them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. So these are foreigners that after the Assyrians had taken captive the Israelites, and this is where the Samaritans come into the picture here, all right? Uh, he, places, uh, he places people of Samaria in there instead of pure Israelites, instead of the children of Israel, and they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there, that they feared not the Lord. These people didn't fear God. They weren't, they weren't worshipers of the one true God. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them because they know not the manner of the God of the land. So God had put some judgment on them. So let's see what the king of Assyria's response was. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests, whom ye brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. Albeit, every nation made gods of their own. <laughs> 
And I'm telling you, when some when places go into apostasy, it doesn't matter what you try to teach them. Amen. They're going to do what they want to do. Howbeit, every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places, which the Samaritans had made, every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. And the men of Babylon made Sagoth Banoth, and the men of Kuth made Nergal, and the men of Hamath made Ashima. And it goes on, and it says in so, verse 32, So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. They want to do both. They want to do both. There's a spirit in the, in the loose today that people want to hold on to their own religious ideas. They want to hold on to their own persuasions, but... They also want to uh, take on the name of the Lord, and they want to also appear as if they fear God too, really. And to an extent, they, they have a respect for the things of God, and, and they do have a, a reverence for the things of God, but they don't want to serve God only. And verse 34, it says, And to this day they do after the former manners, they fear not the Lord. Neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the law, and commandments which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. So let's go back to Ezra, because this is what Ezra is dealing with. All right, he has some people that were already dwelling in the land. These are not Israelites. All right, these are people that were placed there uh, by the king of Assyria, by the king of Babylon, by foreign elements in the kingdom, and they are worshiping their own God, and they're doing their own thing. And so as a result, Ezra has to deal with these folks, all right? And let's see what Ezra's response is. Is it, come and build, join us, help us out. We could use the help, you know, many hands make light, make light the work and so on. No, absolutely not. Verse number three, it says, but Zerubbabel, but Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, ye have nothing to do with us. The bill, that, that is so harsh. That is so judgmental. You have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God. But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. And as these old brethren uh, were working on this, uh, were working on the temple, and these false brethren came in among them, they sent them packing. Listen, you're not gonna you're not gonna join with us. Why? Because you're not gonna bring uh, your Babylonian false system of worship among the true people of God and make it make it the same. It'll be a cheap imitation at best. And so we'll see, we see that uh, Ezra and the and the and those prophets and those priests they dealt with them soundly, but unfortunately they didn't. The enemy doesn't give up that easy. And so in verse number four, it says, Then the people of the land, and who were the people of the land? Pagans? Okay, in a sense, but the, we just read in Second Kings, they were people who had systems of worship that were not according to the pattern of, of the Bible, according to the pattern of God's word, and they wanted to be the people of God. That's who they were. That's who was opposing the true people of God, people that wanted both. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. And what did they do? They hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And anytime there is a move of God, there will be stiff opposition. It says in verse number six, and in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. So this, they go to Ezra, they ask to build, and Ezra keeps the camp clean. He says, we're going to be a separate and distinct people. We're going to be a unified people, and we're going to keep it that way. Um, but these Babylonian leaders would frustrate the people of God. And they would get to him eventually. And, uh, and we go down to Ezra chapter 4. In verse number 23, it says, Now, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Sh Shimshai the scribe and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem unto the Jews and made them to cease by force 
and power. All right. Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. I want us to actually draw. I actually want to draw just a few thoughts here. Uh, religious people will oppose more in our time than overt sinners ever will. It will be uh, the religious people will line up the most against the true. And I would say in our time, uh, it's going to be folks that call themselves Church of God who will line up the most against the true. Religious leadership will play politics uh, to thwart the building of the King of God. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened here. There was some political maneuvers made in order to get the king uh, to decree that they should stop building. Now, there's a couple things we should notice here. So the people of God did cease to build and they did stop and they capitulate and they content themselves with building up their livelihood. So because uh, they felt that they were their, I guess they felt their hand was forced, so to speak. All right. And I say, I guess, and I'll, 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 I'll say why in just a moment. But uh, they felt because to a degree their hand was forced that they might as well just go about business as usual. And so we'll, we'll study this a little later uh, when we get to uh, when we get to the apostasy of the sixth seal in a little in a little more detail. But they build up their homes and their gardens and their schools and they just make a nice life uh, for themselves because, hey, after all, we're not allowed to go and to uh, to build up the kingdom of God. And so they capitulated. There was no real burden. I don't see any real burden in this chapter where the people of God right after this get down on their face before God and begin to rot before God and say, God, help us. And we're going to build anyways. And we want to go forward. They, they, they basically just allow it uh, to happen. The prophets. So this is this is why I say that I don't believe it was God's will for them to leave off building. And I, I don't believe that they were without a choice. And the reason being and we'll study this a little later. But Haggai and Zechariah do not put the blame on the does not put the blame on the government for why the temple was not being built. But when they came along to preach and begin to stir up the people, all right, he puts the blame on the people of God and he holds them responsible responsible because at the end of the day, God is greater than any decree of man. And whenever the church begins to capitulate and adhere to the decrees of men. We're in a world of trouble. When we are no longer letting the Holy Ghost rule and govern the church, we are going to be in a world of hurt. And so eventually this work ceased. It started off so glorious. Oh, they're shouting. The foundation was built. And then some politics get played and some uh, political maneuvers are made and some uh, religious leadership. Uh, that was opposed to the people of God begin to uh, begin to di diplomatically uh, negotiate a, a settlement with the king of Persia to cause the people of God to cease to build. And there, uh, that's where that foundation would sit for about 16 years. That foundation would just sit there, and there was no building going on. But what were the people of God doing? They were building their houses. They were getting their jobs and their careers. And they were sending their children to school and they were making sure that their gardens were well kept. And so as a result, the kingdom of God and the work of God suffered. And so that's actually where we'll leave. Um, we'll leave off this part of, we'll, and we're going to jump over and look at the parallel uh, in Revelation. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Verse number 12 tonight. Revelation 6, we'll begin with verse number 12. Looking at the parallel to this time and the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. We've come a long way. Started off with Samuel and John the Baptist. And tonight we are looking at the restoration of the people of God coming out of papalism and Protestantism. Revelation chapter 6, verse number 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. 
And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide uh, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand. We want to take this piece by piece. We want to look at that sun. We'll, we'll talk about the earthquake in a little bit. So there are three earthquakes in the book of Revelation to put those in the proper time period. There's an earthquake in the morning time. There's an earthquake in the sixth seal. And there's an earthquake in the seventh seal. So technically one earthquake in the morning time, two earthquakes in the evening time. And the evening time being comprised of the seventh, sixth and seventh dispensations of the gospel day. The morning time shook the then known world and the sixth seal did the same and i think sometimes uh, if we don't if we're not well abreast with our history books uh, we kind of underestimate the job uh, that those six seal brethren did but the gospel truly did go into all the world uh, they were the gospel trumpet was in multiple nations going into russia to india to the to the asian countries through europe uh, down into south america it was going all across the world. This gospel was shaking up denominationalism. Even secular books speak of D.S. Warner. It is not just Church of God books that speak of D.S. Warner as a reformer. But there are even um, there are even secular books from that time that knew of D.S. Warner, definitely knew who he was. Uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica, I believe in the early 1900s, I don't know the exact year, uh, but they wrote that the Church of God was the fastest growing uh, movement in the in the world. It was the fastest growing movement in the world. So the Church of God was definitely taking the world by storm. Let's look at this sun became black because if we just take it at face value, uh, we might kind of wonder um, that looks like the sun's going out. That doesn't look like a... Um, you know, looks like a negative thing, and, and we want to get the proper understanding of why that's a negative thing and who that pertains to. Matthew chapter 24, please. Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to start reading, we're just going to read a few verses here, actually. Uh, verse number 29. Matthew 24 is a prophetic book and uh, actually takes us down through the gospel day. And we'll notice that the language here in Matthew 24 is very similar to the language that we just read in Revelation chapter 6. Uh, verse number 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, or meaning after the days of the long night of papalism and Protestantism, or the long apostasy. Of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Sounds very similar to Revelation 6, verse number 12. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is not talking about the end of the world. We'll explain in a moment. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. There's no need for gathering at the end of the world. All right. By that time, there's no need to send angels into uh, to gather his elect from the four winds. When God splits the clouds, uh, there'll be no it'll be final and there'll be no time to be gathering and there'll be no need for a ministry to go out and gather. That time is now. We are in preliminary judgment. We are in that time um, at this very moment. Let's go over to Revelation 15. We'll tie this all in. Uh, with Matthew 24, but Revelation 15, verse number one says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And these plagues would tie into Matthew chapter 24, uh, when he says the signs of the Son of Man in heaven. All right, and, Re and Revelation chapter 6 
as well. All right, so we see these scriptures have very similar language. We know that the evening light ministry was a vile ministry, and we know that vials, uh, if we were to interpret them as the judgments of God and the plagues and the vials, uh, coordinate one with the other. All right, this is a picture when the sixth seal opens. This is a picture of the evening light ministry and the evening light ministry having those plagues in their hand. This is a ministry with a special message. And if we were to go back and look at the plagues, what was surrounding, what was the central message that surrounded all that transpired with the plagues? What was Moses demanding of Pharaoh to let the people of God go? To let the people of God go. What was the message of the sixth seal? The same. To let God's people go. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I will. The message of the seventh seal ministry is the same. To let the people of God go. And that should be our prayer. And that should be our aim. That God will give his people their freedom. Amen. To worship God in spirit and in truth. All right. What was the message of the sixth seal? It was to come out of her. And those that refused to come out, that son, the light they once had, they ha some of them had light on justification. We saw some of them had light on sanctification. In fact, under Wesley's era, the scripture says that two-thirds of the light shone. But when three-thirds light came, when the light came by this ministry to let the people of God go, and people decided to stay in Babylon, they decided to stay in bondage, they decided to stay where they were because their grandfather went to the Methodist church because their name was on the roll book because they were baptized in that location. So for whatever reason, for convenience sake, for sentiment sake, for family sake, whatever it was, for those who decided to stay, they went into darkness. God rejected them. They were judged. Those people were judged. Those souls were judged as walking against light. And to them, it became sin. You do not play with light. You do not play with God. When God begins to reveal things, when God begins to show things, amen, when God, amen, is beginning to shine light on the false systems of men and people refuse to walk in that light and people refuse to obey that light, God will judge it. God will judge it and you will go into darkness. Amen. The, the light that you once had, amen, you will go into darkness. Let's study on here. In Matthew 24, we see the, um, actually, I believe Revelation 6 here. And in Matthew 24, we see this phraseology and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. I can't find the exact scripture I want right now. I'll look it up and. Uh, put it out there, but all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. All the tribes of the earth mourn. Earth and religion does not like the truth poured out on them. And that's all the six seal brethren had. That's all the six seal brethren had. And in Matthew 24, it says he shall send his angels. Amen. And God sent his ministry in this time. God began to send his ministry. Amen. And he sent his angels. Amen. To gather. Amen. And where were they gathering from? Amen. The four winds of the earth. Amen. So the scripture we're referencing there, Matthew 24, verse 30, the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels so that Jesus Christ, the son of God, anointed his ministry with a great sound of a trumpet. We saw the trumpets in uh, in literal Israel when we were studying back there at the foundation. We see when the six still brethren began to take a stand, they got a message. They have trumpets. And they are gathering. It's a gathering message. It's a come out of her message. Amen. From the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So when we see the sixth seal open, we see three things occur. We see a great earthquake or three things we want to discuss tonight. Great earthquake. We see the sun is darkened and we see the moon is turned to blood. Amen. Let's deal with the great. Uh, let's deal with this message first. We'll. We, we kind of got ahead of ourselves dealing with the sun 
uh, being darkened. But let's go back up here to Revelation 18.4, and let's talk about this great earthquake just a little bit. Amen. The great earthquake. Revelation 18.4. And we may continue to... We're going to continue to deal with this great earthquake, but just as a maybe a little foreshadowing, this isn't the greatest earthquake. Because the scripture lets us know that the greatest earthquake uh, was not seen until the last earthquake. Amen. And I, I challenge any minister in this country, you tell me when that happened. Amen. You want to tell me that the greatest earthquake of all has already occurred? I'd like to know when. All right. Revelation chapter 18, verse number four says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So the message of the sixth seal was to come out of her, my people, because you're in jeopardy of becoming a sinner if you stay down there, because God's light has come. And this is a message of God gathering his people. It is a gathering together. It is the unity of God's people. One of the biggest dangers that D.S. Warner had to deal with, that people challenged D.S. Warner and those six cell brethren had to deal with, was how to avoid becoming a sect themselves and so one of the things that they said is that we are anti-sectarianism and you not careful you can just become the anti-sect sect i'm just against sects uh, other sectarians other groups and this that and the other all right but what the what the real the essence of warner's message is this is that if you are saved and if you are sanctified we should not be divided up into these different groups and into these different places by creeds of men Things that are not founded in the Bible, by the Bible, doesn't mean anything goes, all right, that you can just do whatever you want. But if it's not in the Bible, we have to sacrifice it at the altar of truth, and we have to forsake it, amen, and come together with all of God's people. And to not do so, you're in jeopardy of being out of order uh, with God. Let's talk a little bit about these four winds uh, where the angels were sent uh, to gather. Matthew 24, 31 talks about the four, the four winds. Ephesians 4 4, real quickly. Ephesians 4 4 says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called, in one hope of your calling. All right. So, God's intention has always been for God's people uh, to be gathered together. However, false systems of religion have divided God's people up. We, we won't turn there, but Revelation 17, 15 talks about the waters being people. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 20 says, uh, the wicked are as the troubled sea. Waters and sea are not a depiction of God's people. Amen. They're not a depiction of God's people. What do these four winds represent? It's where God's people have been scattered. It's where they've been tossed about. Amen. Because God's people are to be one. And so the six seal brethren came with a message to undo that. Amen. To call, call God's people back together. God was calling out of all these different places where God's people had been scattered all over the place, been tossed about with every wind of doctrine. God was calling out of paganism, which was the message of repentance. Amen. Papalism and Protestantism, his people that were bound up in these religious systems of men that did not have their freedom to worship God aright. God began to send a ministry that would call them out. Continue on with this earthquake. The first earthquake took place in Revelation 8, 5 on the day of Pentecost. And the fire of the Holy Ghost fell. We see the altar is Christ. And we see that they erected the altar uh, when they came up out of Babylon there in Ezra. We see also under the Protestant age, under the fifth seal, there were souls that were slain underneath the altar. They were praying uh, for God to bring his people together. We discussed that last week. And we see a second earthquake in Revelation 6, 12. What does an earthquake do? It, well, it's a shaking time. Things get upset. They get broken loose. The earth is shaken up, and as a result, things get rearranged. And if you're a real saint of God, you should be able to shout while that's happening. Amen. And if you're not, you're probably going to be looking for the uh, you're probably going to be looking for the for the rocks in the caves to hide you. Amen. From the uh, from the from the judgments of God that are falling. The six seal earthquake saw a mighty unleashing and manifestation of truth and the word. They preached the one church, and that message sounded totally different than anything preached in the dark. I should say than anything preached in the dark and cloudy day. And so a lot 
lot of people, they, they weren't really, really willing to embrace it because it wasn't something they had really heard before because their ears uh, had not had not been accustomed to hearing what the spirit of God was saying. They had been accustomed uh, to following something other than God. And so that message was harsh and offensive to many. Uh, we're not going to turn to these scriptures, but if you'd like to study the earthquake uh, in the Bible and what earthquakes do, you'll see it in Joel 3, 16 and 17. Uh, Exodus 19 and 20 talks about when God spoke on Mount Sinai and his voice shook the earth. Hebrews 12 talks about you are not come unto that literal mountain, that you are coming to Mount Zion, which he said is a more fearful, which is a more fearful place than uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, and talks about uh, fear and quaking. Uh, I, I exceedingly fear and, uh, and quake. Joel 2, 10 and 11 talks about the earth shall quake. This line That lines up succinctly uh, with Revelation chapter 6, 12 through 17. The earth represents people, and truth always will shake people. And again, those references in Hebrews chapter 12, 27 through 28, we know uh, that uh, we have, the, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says we have this treasure, in earth and vessels. It's talking about individuals. And so when this six seal message came to come out of her, that was unfamiliar to people. That was not what they had been hearing down through the dark ages and even in through Protestantism. Uh, it was that you need to join a denomination. In fact, some people would get saved at a meeting, but then after the meeting, they'd ask you, well, you're going to become a Methodist, you're going to become a Baptist, basically where are you going to go? And what denomination are you going to join up with? But these brethren came and said, listen, if you are saved, if you've been blushed, washed by the blood of the Lamb, you're already in the body of Christ, and there's no need to divide up the body of Christ into a, uh, to, into a thousand different uh, into a thousand different groups. All right, let's go back to Revelation six, and let's talk about the stars of heaven. The stars of heaven fell in verse number thirteen. Revelation six, verse number thirteen talks about the stars of heaven fell. We're going to come back again to the sun and the moon. Revelation uh, six thirteen talks about the stars of heaven fell. Why did they fall? Because they were shaken. They got shaken off. They were shaken by the wind. Amen. Acts two uh, verses two and four talks about the Holy Ghost as a mighty rushing wind. Those brethren were preaching under the power of the Holy Ghost, and it was shaking heaven and earth. Amen. And the scriptures talk about not only will I shake uh, will I shake the earth, but I will shake heaven and earth. God was shaking everywhere. Amen. And things were beginning to loosen up and be broken up and be rearranged. Amen. And stars, amen, that once held the light. They had the light on salvation. They had the light of justification, the light of sanctification, but they refused to walk in the light of the unity of God's people. And those stars that were once shining so bright, they fell. They fell. People had had confidence in them. People respected them. Amen. But those stars, those ministers, amen, they could shine no more because greater light had come and they were refusing to walk in it. Come back real briefly to the sun became black. When Jesus came, he ushered in a new day. We know that the Old Testament talks about the lesser light being the moon and the greater light being the sun. And we, if you were to go study Genesis chapter one, you know that the evening preceded, preceded the morning. And so the light of the moon uh, preceded the light of the sun. And you can see those in Malachi chapter four, verse two. And we won't turn there. Neither will we turn to Revelation 22, 16. Amen. But both of those reference um, Jesus Christ bringing in a new day. Um, and we know that the woman was clothed with the sun, ushering in the New Testament church or the light of the New Testament church uh, or the New Testament covenant. The sun became black, black darkness of death, spiritual death came. When the message of the one church came, and we talked about that just a few minutes ago, and the moon also became blood. And in looking back at the Old Testament, it only points to Jesus Christ. John chapter 5, verse number 39 says the following. It says, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. He's telling them, search the Old Testament, because those scriptures testify of me. Amen. So the Old Testament pointed. Uh, to Jesus Christ, and it pointed them back to the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And they, when the message of the church came out, people who did not accept it, they did not backslide outwardly. They did not cease to profess to have the blood. They didn't cease uh, to uh, profess to be Christians. Amen. But they apostatized. They kept professing. They kept saying they were God's people, even though light had come, they walked against light. And this is going to be the... Uh, the sad demise of many people around the church of God, instead of just taking down their sign, 
and saying that they don't have it anymore, they're going to keep claiming something that they do not have. And as a result, they're going to be apostate. Amen. They're going to be apostate. They continue to profess. We can get a picture of this. Hebrews chapter 6. Let's turn there real quick. Hebrews chapter 6, uh, verse number 6 says, If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance... Sorry, let's go up. For it is impossible, verse 4, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. This isn't talking about backsliders here. Let's get the picture. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away. And we actually discussed this early on in our Bible study. That word fall away is not talking about backsliding. A falling away is talking about an apostle. <laughs> If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Or what Paul or the Hebrew writer was dealing with here is people who had tasted of Christianity, had repented of their sins and believed God and would turn back to Judaism, would turn back to another religion and say that that was truth. To call that which they once uh, said was false, to, that they had tasted of the Holy Ghost. They had witnessed the Holy Ghost down in their vessel. If they fall away and then not just backslide, not go out to the world, but go to false religion and say that that's the truth. He said they have crucified themselves, the, the, uh, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. It's one thing to backslide. It's a totally different thing to go out and say that something other than truth is truth. All right, Revelation 6, verse number 14. Let's wrap this up here. Revelation chapter 6. Go back to Revelation chapter 6. We're looking at the sixth seal, the restoration of the church of God and the gospel day. From division to unity. It says, and the heaven departed as a scroll. Amen. That means it came together. Amen. From one end to the other as a scroll. God's people coming together. Amen. Let's go over to Isaiah 34, and we'll read verse number four real quick, just to draw a thought here. Isaiah 34. This is a representation, representative of God's people coming together. Isaiah 34, verse number four, it says, And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall ro be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Amen. So this is a picture of of God's people going from a place of division to a place of unity, coming together, amen, on the word of God. It says, and the heaven departed as a scroll, all these different sectarian places and groups and fellowships, amen. God was crying out against it. God's people were coming together, amen. And heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. They were shaken, every mountain. Amen. God doesn't have more than one mountain. God only has one mountain, and that's Mount Zion. Amen. God doesn't have all these little islands. Amen. God only has one church. Amen. And so God's people were coming together in a mighty way under this reformation. Amen. Revelation 6, verse 15 says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves. In the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Amen. So mountains indicate places of worship. Amen. But there's only one place which there's only one true place of worship. Amen. And that's on Mount Zion. Amen. That's where the church of God is. The earthquake moved all these others out of their place. Amen. And moved all these others out of the, all these others out of this place. And people were looking for a place to hide. Amen. And they were trying, they were trying to hide themselves in the dens. And in the rocks, amen. And there's only one rock, amen. And that's Christ Jesus, amen. They were trying to hide in these various man-made religions, trying to hide in their creeds, trying to hide in their uh, in their history, trying to hide in their uh, uh, in their rites and their rituals and their ordinances and their forms, amen. But when truth came, it began, amen, to expose those things, amen. And they were looking for a place, amen, to hide because they didn't want to come out and take a stand for the truth. They'd rather say to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us, 
keep us. Amen. They're looking for refuge in these places of religion. Amen. And so the Bible says in verse 16, it said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. What did these six seal brethren had? These were a vile ministry. Amen. They had judgment. They had judgment. And verse 17 says, for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? And they began to keep going. They didn't, they wasn't good enough just for these rocks and mountains to keep covering them. They went hunting for them. Amen. God's ministry, amen. They can be fishers or they can be hunters. In Mark, the first chapter, verse 17, he said, follow me and I shall make you fishers of men. But we also know that God's ministry is supposed to be some hunters. And they're going to have to go into these rocks and these caves. Amen. And they're going to have to get some people out of there. Jeremiah 16, 16. Let's draw that thought here. Amen. God is sending forth his ministry to hunt some people up out of Babylon. Amen. Jeremiah 16, verse 16 says, Behold, I will send them for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. Amen. They're trying to hide. People were trying to hide in these earthen systems of religion. Amen. But God was sending forth his ministry, sending forth his angels to gather his elect. Amen. To get them out of there. Amen. And amen. To bring him to Mount Zion, to a place of safety. Amen. The judgment was coming down under the sixth seal. Amen. And people were rejoicing in it. Amen. This is the time of preliminary judgment. That's why God sends forth a judgment ministry, trying to prepare, uh, prepare his people for his coming. Amen. And we are in that time of preliminary judgment, the wrath of the lamb. Amen. The morning, the evening time ministry in both parts, the sixth and the seventh seal. We're a vile ministry and a ministry that is trying to prepare the people of God for the second coming of Christ. Amen. We appreciate your attention tonight to the word of God. That's what we have. Uh, next week, we'll go into um, a little bit more of uh, the end of the sixth seal and, into the, and work our way into the seventh as this series will be coming to a close shortly. Uh, maybe one or two more and we'll be through with this series. Amen. And we appreciate God, how he's been helping us and blessing us through it. And we just ask that. Uh, God would continue to enlighten our minds and that we continue to study. If there's any um, comments or questions, uh, as always, you're at liberty to make them known at this time. May God bless you this evening.